Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Lynn M. from the Oaken Mills Group, Larry F. from the 12 Steps of Life Group, Julian H. from Mahogany 12 and 12. They'll be sharing their experience with steps 10, 11, and 12, which are continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. With that, let the speakers go. Hi there, my name is Jillian. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Hey, Jillian. Um, I'm a home group member at Magadie 12 and 12. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my sobriety date is um, is February 4th or February 1st, 2004. I have uh, two children at home with croup, and I have not slept in a week. So I was thinking since we are going to be talking about the 11th step, we would spend the next 15 minutes in silent meditation. (laughs) Um, No, for real. (laughs) Um, uh, Just a little bit. We're only supposed to talk about 15 minutes. I could talk about meditation all day. It's uh, really transformed my life. But here's basically what happened, happened to me. Um, I got sober, um, when I was 22 years old and I, um, I came in here just a a complete, my my life up until the point I got sober was just a complete mess. I came in here just not knowing who I was. My life was just shattered into a thousand different pieces. And, um, I came in here and I did the steps really, really quickly. And, um, I had this super profound spiritual experience and God entered into my heart in such a profound way. And I, that I knew without any shadow of a doubt that God existed and that God loved me and I was a changed person and it happened really quickly. Um, and it was the most amazing thing that had ever happened to me up until that point. And I was doing tons of AA meetings and began sponsoring a ton of people. And, you know, my life began to change really quickly. And, you know, I began getting promoted at my job. And I met a man and I got married and started having kids. And um, I guess a couple years into it, what happened was, uh, I guess what they say, like I fell off my pink cloud. And um, I didn't know what I was doing wrong. And... um you know, still going to meetings, maybe not so many as I once was, but you know, life, life was just getting busy and, um, still sponsoring people, but maybe not as many. And I just didn't know really where to turn. And, um, I got a new sponsor and, um, I guess the direction that my life turned, what happened, um, I really began to pursue meditation and, um, that's really where, I began to find the relief that I was looking for and I began to find, um, the love in my heart again and began to find direction in my life again. And I say this, um, because maybe you too, um, have fallen off your pink cloud, you know, and it took me, it took me years, you know, I I guess it was probably I had five or six years sober. Um, and I began to feel back on track again. And, um, it was, it was really scared because I, I guess I had, I guess what happened was, you know, I knew that God loved me because I'd had such a profound experience in the beginning, but I had no idea how to get it back again. And so what happened for me was, um, I just spent years just looking, looking and not knowing where to go. And, um, what I had to do was, it was just a search for me, um, Sorry, I'm just so out of it. Um, My first step was getting involved in a meditation group. Um, For me, um, I had to get quiet. It wasn't um, a matter of uh, 
I couldn't like just turn off the radio on the way, like on the car ride. That wasn't uh, where I was going to find God. I had to get quiet. And, um, you know, they say prayer and meditation. Um, for me, the meditation, um, I had to s- start listening for God's direction. And um, I had to find the direction in the silence. You know, for me, it was like, I was always asking, you know, God, what's your direction for me? What's your direction for me? And I, I just couldn't find it. And it was because I was always like, God, you know, what do you want for me? What do you want for me? And I wasn't listening for it. And I had to find time throughout my day to get quiet and really, really listen for it. And when I started taking time throughout my day to really begin listening for it, my life began to change. <laughs> and for so many years, what I, what I found was... Um, you know, I was working this job, and I really thought that, like, you know, being kind to the people around me, you know, this is me bringing the vision of God's will into my life. This is me being kind to the people around me. This is me, you know, um, being spiritual, me being really kind and loving to my husband. This is me being spiritual. I thought that, like, these roles that I was living, this is me being a spiritual person, and I really thought that, that's how I was going to grow closer to God. Me being a spiritual person, me doing, me being the best person I could in all these roles. And I thought that that's who I was, that these roles that I was playing, that that's who I was. And the more that I began to develop in, in my meditation, I began to realize that my inner divinity has nothing to do with these roles that I play. Um, That who I am spiritually has nothing to do with that. And it gives me just this greater sense of freedom in everything that I'm doing. It gives me more love, more love in everything that, everything that I have. I've got more love to give in everything. It's been able to give me more love to sponsor people, more love to give to my children, things like that. I feel like I'm <laughs> Anyway, um, um, <laughs> um, going on to um, the the twelfth step. Um, uh, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> An alcoholic name is Lynn. Um, so I kind of live in 10 and 11 and 12. Um, you know, if you follow the big book, um, it's kind of funny because there's not that much is really in 10. You know, it's not. Um, there's a lot of promises in 10, but there's not a whole lot. There's like, you know, maybe like a paragraph about 10 in terms. It basically just says like, Here's a couple of things you, we want you to look out for. Selfishness, all that kind of stuff. So let me tell you what I do in terms of 10. I have a, I have a, an inventory card, and it's a little nasty because here's my deal. Um, every night when I'm brushing my teeth, because um, everybody says, you know, God, I'm so tired at night. I lay down, and I start doing my inventory, and I fall asleep. So I fix that because that was my problem. So what I do is when I'm washing my face and I'm brushing my teeth, I do my inventory. It's on a 3 by 5 index card, and that's why it looks nasty. Um, and it says selfishness, dishonesty, indirect communication, avoidance, fear. Um, I have all this stuff that I look out for. Do I need to discuss anything with anybody, make amends? Um, <laughs> what went right? Right? Because in the 10th step, in the 12, uh, in the, uh, yeah, 12 by 12, talks about that part too. Um, and then I'll talk in the 11th step about something else I do. Um, but I do that when I'm brushing my teeth and I'm washing my face because I'm not going to fall asleep during that process. Um, <laughs> unless I need to pick up a new chip. But anyway, so so the thing is, is that, that that's what I do for my 10th step. Um, and uh, and that seems to go pretty good for me. Um, and that, that covers the 10th step. Um, you know, the other part is, is that... Uh, 
you know, in the, in the 12 and 12, it talks about, you know, the different times we do that, right? So that covers like my daily thing. And then it talks about those like, you know, periodic ones, right? So, so the thing is, is in those, in those tween, in those, in those years where, like I was, you know, I was kind of like, you know, I would stand up here and I would be like, I go in for an annual house cleaning. Um, and that was awesome because I did. And, uh, and I had like these, these years that I had all this documentation that I could show you that I did my annual house cleaning. <laughs> and the thing is, is that, that that was awesome. And the thing, it just sat there. Um, because I did a house cleaning and I shared it with somebody, but I didn't do anything else. Um, I cleaned house and I shared it with somebody, but I didn't work six and seven on it. If I needed to make amends with somebody, they didn't go back on that list of eight and nine. Um, and the thing that I'm finding anymore is that is it an annual house cleaning or what I'm finding in a daily a daily check is that for me it goes back to six and seven and eleven. Um, is I know what those fears are. I told you, right? If you want to rewind the seat, find the thing, it goes back to the fact that I don't think I'm good enough, right? That biggest fear is um, I can put it on a three-by-five index card and I can just tell you, any single resentment, any fear, anything about sex, any kind of harm I make, it all goes back to that, you know, see the first side of the index card, you know, I'm not good enough. Um, and and if I'm not paying attention to that, that's what gets me into trouble. Um, and so I need to continue to not only take that that inventory, but make sure that I'm following through the rest of the steps for me. Um, so then, So then let's talk about 11. Because the coolest thing with 11, if you don't own this book, let me just make a shameless plug. All right, it is Conference Approval Literature, it's Language of the Heart. Cool book. So um, this is page 240 for anybody listening along at home. Um, this little sketch of my own Pilgrim's Progress is offered to illustrate where I and maybe lots of other AAs have still been missing some of the top importance. Through lack of discipline, attention, and sometimes through lack of the right kind of faith, or maybe us keeping ourselves at year after year in a rather easy spiritual kindergarten I've just described, but most inevitably we become dissatisfied. We have yet to admit we have hit an uncomfortable and maybe a very painful sticking point. What is it then? The chances are better that even that we shall locate our trouble and our misunderstanding and neglect of AA Step 11, prayer, meditation, and the guidance of God. The other steps can keep most of us sober and somehow functioning, but step 11 can even keep us growing if we tried hard and work at it continually. If we expend even 5% of the time on step 11 that we habitually and rightly lavish on step 12, the results can be wonderfully far-reaching. That is an almost uniform experience of those who have constantly practiced step 11. And that, hands down, is probably one of my favorite passages about the 11th step. Um, and Bill wrote that... Um, I think, if I'm correct, I think in like his um, eighth or ninth year sober when he wrote that letter, and I believe it was published in the Grapevine. Um, and it talks about, in, in the big book, um, where it talks about, you know, if we, if after a time, if we, ter- if we go to a, sp- a spiritual or religious practice, then we, we integrate that into, into our meditation. Um, and I'm not going to go into it, but I actually, um, after many years, I... I did join a, a spiritual practice, not a religion, a spiritual practice that has definite devotions. Um, and so I integrate those with my sobriety. So they are part of my daily meditation. So, you know, the funny part is, is that, you know, you go to an 11-step meeting, and so I get up and I talk about it, and I go, I get up every single morning, I get on my knees, I come out, I come out of the bed and I roll up, and I hit, hit, my, hit the bed knees first, right? And I ask God to keep me sober. I spend an hour in meditation pretty much every day, maybe less, right? So I, I do a meditation. I have a compassion practice. I have an equanimity practice. Blah, blah, blah. And then somebody gets up at, inevitably and goes, yeah, well, I just keep it simple. So, and that's, you know what? And the thing is, is that, that the deal is, is that, that whatever works for you, at the end of the day, the, can, the deal is, is that it's, it's between you and your higher power. What you consider God you know, how, however you connect to God, if you are, if, if it's between, if it's walking your dog at the end of the day, and that's how you connect to God, if it's, if it's sitting by a stream, if it's riding in your car, if it's grocery shopping, whatever that connection is between you and God, find it. But the bottom line is, is that, 
is that for me, I found something that works. And, and that's how, that's how I'm able to do it. Um, so I have a morning, I have a morning devotion, um, or actually morning meditation that I go through. Again, what it has helped me to do is to find compassion for others. It's helped me in all my other steps. Um, and it's helped me to grow spiritually. Um, many years ago, um, uh, for those of you who saw Pretty Woman, that part where Richard Gere says, I was very angry with him. <laughs> um, I was walking around and I was very angry. Um, and it was easy for people to see. Um, when I talked to you, I didn't look you in the eye. Um, I didn't listen to your answers. I didn't give a damn about your answers. Um, but the thing is, is that it, um, meditation allowed me to sit quietly within myself and to actually get to the point where I could care about you. Um, and that took me a really long time. Um, it took a long time for people to not have a knee-jerk reaction when I, when they told me something. Um, it took a long time at work for people to, um, not be afraid of me, to be concerned about that response. Um, it took a long time for my father and I to speak. Um, it took a long time for my stepmother and I to get on the phone together and for me, the two of us, not to bait one another. Um, and the, you know, a moment and a turning point between our relationship where I knew that meditation was working was when um, she screamed at me for five minutes and I said, you sound really, you sound really upset. And she screamed for louder for three more minutes. And I said, I said, this sounds like it's something that's really been bothering you. And she got way more upset and strung together expletives. I swear I've never heard her string before. And, um, and, uh, and I said, I'm, I'm really glad that I have this opportunity to listen to you. And she threw the phone across the room. Um, and my dad got on the phone and said, what, what did you do? And I said, I listened to her and I validated her feelings. And he said, for the love of God, you should have fought with her. Um, and I said, I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. And the thing is, is that she went from at that moment from picking up the phone and hearing my voice and saying, I'll get your father to picking up the phone, hearing my voice and saying, how are you, honey? What's going on? How's it going? Um, last year, they f they came out for my 40th birthday party. I used to stand from a podium and be able to tell you very proudly that my parents had never crossed a threshold of a place that I had owned. I used to say it with bitterness. I used to say it with anger. But I used to say it with pride. And now I will tell you, they celebrated my 40th birthday party. They came, and let me tell you something. They met my friends, and they were like, oh, my God, who are these crazy people? You know, but the thing is, is that what they finally understood is the love that you guys have, the unconditional love, and they felt it. And the thing that I can say is thank you. Thank you for the 11th step. And I can also say thank you for the 12th step. Because every single 12th step that you guys work, it's my first step. And you give that to me. Um, you know, the 12th step, first thing is I want to say as a blanket statement, Service work makes 12-step work possible. And, um, and, and that was drilled into me from day one. Um, again, you know, kind of like has already been said, had somebody not arranged for the coffee and the cake, the meeting wouldn't ha be here. It wouldn't happen today. Um, and, uh, you know, service work, reaching out to other alcoholics, and let me tell you something, sometimes the person that is hurting is the one that has nine years, whose life is falling apart, um, who's attending meetings, who is doing stuff on the outside. But the thing is, is that what you're doing is you're, you're comparing their highlight reel to like, you know, like, you know, the, the script that is running every single day inside them. And, and sometimes what, what we don't know is that when you just reach out and you say, you know, you doing okay. The person in your home group that you haven't seen for a while, like that's the phone call that's got to be made. Not, not, you know, and, and the thing is, is I'm not saying don't reach out to a newcomer. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But, but all, but it's everything is helping the alcoholic 
You know, we put up gold stars for ourselves all the time, and I do it. We put up gold stars when we take when we take a newcomer out for coffee, when we take you know somebody out for um for, for dinner, right? We do that. But but the twelfth with the twelfth I'm sorry the seventh tradition is self support everywhere, um, and it's carrying that message no matter where we are. Um, so it's you know it, it's living this everywhere. Um, the spiritual awakening that I had through all of this was was about practicing these principles everywhere. Um, the hardest place to do it is in my home. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't had the privilege to to really do that um, since, as I mentioned before, the relationship that I had dissolved. Um, the thing is, is that that I believe that what's happening is is that every single day God is honing me to 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 be that that partner. Um, and what I'm doing is every single day I'm getting a better opportunity to get up in the morning and to learn how to be that person. I believe that every single day I'm learning, um, you know, through trial and error. <laughs> Um, every single day I get up and I try to be a better employee, um, through that inventory that I did, I was not time clock honest. Um, I would get up and, you know, the worst thing to ever happen to me in the world was the internet. Um, <laughs> you know, and, uh, so I wasn't, and, and you know, in, in inventory, I have to be, you know, every single day I have to ask myself, was I time clock honest today? How much time did I give to them versus how much time did I give, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to Facebook, you know? Now I have a cell phone, so, you know, am I, am I paying attention, more attention to instant messenger or am I paying more attention to Pinterest or am I actually working today? You know, and that's a really difficult question to answer at the end of the day. Um, you know, am I being, am I being a good friend today? Am I being the friend that I would want today? Am I being a good sponsor? Am I being a good sponsee? Um, all of those things, am I being a, just a good person? Because the other part is, is that now that I've, I've kind of, progressed a little bit for me. Um, I, I do a lot in terms of community service. I'm a member of a community today. Um, I don't just walk into my home and disappear. Um, I reach out, I reach out to, to my neighbors, you know, we've had, you know, a lot of stuff goes on in terms of snowstorms, hurricanes. I have elderly people that live up and down my, my row. Um, being someone, being an active member of God's community and being one of God's kids doesn't mean that when it starts to flood that I head indoors and I hibernate. I check on those people. And the thing is, is that, you know, let me say this. I mean, by and large, honestly, when the alarm clock went off this morning, I would have far rather, like, stayed home and curled up under a blanket and been with my animals today. Um, so I don't get it right every day. Um but every single day that I get up, I get another shot at it. Um, and finally, one of my favorite passages out of the 12 and 12. Still more wonderful is the feeling that we do not have to be specially distinguished among our fellows in order to be useful and profoundly happy. Not many of us can lead, be leaders of prominence, nor do we wish to be. Service gladly rendered, obligations squarely met, troubles well accepted or solved with God's help. The knowledge that at home or in the world outside, we are partners in a common effort. The well-understood fact that in God's sight, all human beings are important. The proof that love freely given surely brings a full return. The certainty that we are no longer isolated and alone in self-constructed prisons. The surety that we need no longer be square pegs in round holes, but can fit in God's scheme of things. These are the permanent and legitimate satisfactions of right living for which no amount of pomp and circumstance, no heap of material possessions could possibly substitute. True ambition is not what we thought it was. True ambition is the deep, and desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God. Thank you. I'm Larry, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, still soaking in what was just read, because that true desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God is the ambition it's amazing. Um, anyway, um, my sponsor said, answer three questions to progress through a step. What does the step actually say? What does it ask you to do? And how have you done it? Uh, when we got to 10, 11, and 12, he added two more questions for me. He said, these are two questions that uh, most of us alcoholics should ask ourselves 
two or three times during the course of a day. He said, but Larry, some of us are sicker than others, so you need to ask yourself these two questions about every 15 minutes. <laughs> and the two questions are, um, what is God's vision in this? Where is God in this? And the second question is, what step applies here? And if you do that, every time you face a decision, every time you're getting upset, every time there's some disturbance, it forces you mostly to come back to 10, 11, and 12. Um, where is God in all this? Well, I usually need to pray or meditate to find out. Uh, what step applies here? Usually it's about promptly admitting I was wrong. Sometimes it's about um, some of the other steps. Step three, I do a constant juggling act with step three, my will, God's will, my will, God's will. Um, but those two questions have uh, saved my butt over and over and over again. Now, with step 10, I got a great step 10 example this week, earlier this week. My wife is also in the program. Um, we've been around almost the same exact amount of time, and we've known each other a long time. Um, so earlier this week, I mentioned to her I was coming here. You know, oh, there's this step workshop going on this weekend, you know, because we were thinking about we we're making, making our weekend plans. And uh, I'll be over there for a couple of hours, blah, 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 blah. And the unsaid thing was, you know, why don't you come? So I got done explaining what was going on, that I was coming over here, and she said to me, have fun. <laughs> and that upset me. <laughs> now, the first reaction, the first thought I had was, of course, the keen alcoholic thought was to take her inventory. You could use a couple of meetings, you know. Why don't you get your ass over to this meeting? You could. That was thought one. Thought two was, gee, that kind of hurt my feelings. I mean, she's heard me speak a thousand times. Is she over the wonder of me already? <laughs> <laughs> and then my sponsor's voice. Where is God in all this? What step applies here? Tenth step, the truism, restraint of pen and tongue. So I, those were my first two reactions. I've shared them with you. I did not share them with her. Instead, I went into my kit of tools for successful marriage, and I poured myself a tall, frothy cup of shut the F up. And said nothing. She's happy, I'm happy. No conflict, no stress. I don't have to go back and make an amends for taking her inventory. Tenth step, restraint of pen and tongue. That's what applied here. We move down the road. Life is good. Um, at work, every day, somehow, I, I think one day one of my bosses is going to figure out who I really am. But in the meantime, these idiots have entrusted me with about 110 people that work for me. And uh, I pray for them on a daily basis. But when you have 110 people in the building, that's a lot of personalities. And my job as the boss is when they have a problem with their manager or their whoever, and they're, then they don't get the answer they want is they bring it to me. So I'm the guy who gets problems all day long. That's very upsetting. So they come to me with these problems, and my first reaction a lot of the time is, I don't think you're an alcoholic. You don't have a program. i got some ideas that could help you fix all of this. And again, restraint of pen and tongue. I don't say any of those crazy alcoholics, alcoholic thoughts. Now, this may seem very primitive to you, but it saves my bacon. Because I still, after many years later, have two things that happen in almost any situation. Something will happen, and I will have an immediate shoot from the hip reaction. That one is always the alcoholic one. I have to let that one go by. And then I have to see what comes next. And entertain whether it's a more civil, sober, sane, responsible position than the first one that flew by. Thank God for step 10. Um, the other thing about step 10 is, again, reading exactly what it says. The first word is continued. 
that implies that there's an ongoing process already in place where we are reviewing our inventory. So if you're saying to yourself, you know, I should really get around to doing a tenth step every once in a while, red flag. It's a continued, so there's an ongoing process of some sort. And in my experience with guys that work with me now, I think one of the problems is that we tend to be alcoholic, so we really want precision and we want to formalize this 10th step. And it's great if you write something every night. I'm not knocking it. That's the precise direction that it is in the book. But don't let that be an obstacle to keep you from doing an inventory, whether it's written or not. Take stock. It's an ongoing process. Um, step 11, saw through prayer meditation. Um, meditation, great. What I did with this, the, the only way I could find the discipline to step 11 was to, I have one of them little appointment books, and um, my wife calls me a dinosaur because it's not all on a smartphone, which for me is a dumbass phone because I can never get it to work. So I, I have a, I have a, uh, I actually have a paper appointment book. And what I do each week is I write down in the morning, you know, prayer and meditation, and then, you know, what my appointments are, and then that evening where my meeting's going to be. And what I do is I schedule out my 11th step and my meetings for the week, and then build everything else around that. I, I needed that from, because I am so undisciplined. You know, it's amazing, you know, a butterfly will go by and I'll stop what I'm doing for 20 minutes. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> you know, so I need discipline. I use the book, um, set this up. And um, what happens is, again, coincidences. There's no coincidences. The last few months, my work life has been very frantic, very high pressure, 12-hour days, not a lot of time for much anything else. It's been physically wearing me down. I made mention before that I'm a little under the weather. It's been very stressful. I haven't been sticking to the prayer and meditation schedule. So in the mornings, we have a couple of dogs, love dogs. Let the dogs out in the morning, come in, come upstairs, and then they have to go upstairs to get fed. So what happens is my, my 10-year-old Golden, she, and I swear, this is true, what happens now is we start to go up the stairs, and she runs up about three steps and stops and turns sideways and blocks me from going up the stairs. Because my reaction is to just run up the stairs and feed him and get out of the house. She turns sideways and blocks me. She won't let me go up the stairs until I do a little ear rub and a little belly rub and a little tail rub. And She's got to get this three minutes of massage affection in the morning. And if she doesn't get it, I can't get upstairs. What that's turned into is that's my forced prayer and meditation. When she throws that roadblock at me, I start scratching her and I say my prayers and I do a little meditation and and I do it out loud. She hears the sound of my voice, and she's gotten used to my rhythm. She knows when I'm done. And when I stop, she turns and bolts upstairs because now she knows it's time for breakfast. She's done her job. She's forced me to pray and meditate. You know, that roadblock has been put in my life to stop me from rushing through it. It's crazy. Um, a curmudgeonly thing about the 11th step, because I told you guys before I got this old school. If you're praying for anything else besides God's will for you and the power to carry that out, that's great. I'm glad you're praying, but that ain't the 11th step. The 11th step says specifically, if you read the black words on the page, praying only. Only means limited to, specifically, nothing else. Praying only for God's will for us and the power to carry that out. So I love prayer. Prayer all day long. I do a lot of prayer. Sometimes at work when I get crazy, I run into the bathroom and I, and I go into a stall and I pray. There's a few places in the building where I can be alone and have some quiet. Sometimes I do this trick, too. Any of you do this? This was great when they were pay phones, like in an airport. You pick up a pay phone and you pray. People think you're on the phone. You can even pray out loud. They have no idea you're talking to God. <laughs> so sometimes in my office, so sometimes in my office, I pick up the phone. You know, hello, God, this is Larry calling. I need to talk to you for a minute because I'm about to kill this pain in the air. And I talk to him for a few minutes. People walk by. They think I'm on the phone. They leave me alone. So if you haven't thought of that, you may want to give that a shot. Um, but if we're talking 11-step prayer, it's got to be God's will for us and the power to carry that out. 12th step. Um, again, reading the words that are on the page, if you're looking for some hope and experience today, if you're looking for some hope, the first few words of the 12th step, having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, 
Now, I love Bill's phrasing there. Those words are really important. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps. He didn't write, possibly you may have a spiritual experience, or probably you will have a spiritual experience, or there's a remote chance in hell you might have a spiritual experience. He was definite. It's, it's, it's present. It's, it's a past participle, actually, old English teacher, having had a spiritual experience. There's, that's declarative. There's no other possibility, having had a spiritual experience. So if you're sitting here and you're balking about the steps or you haven't gotten to the 12th step yet, there's the hope. There's no doubt about it. If you practice the first 11 steps, when you, by the time you get to 12, you will have had a spiritual experience. It says so in the book, and so far after all these years, I haven't found any place yet where the book has lied to me. It says, having had a spiritual experience. I love that. Um, what hope? You know, I spent all my life drinking spirits, trying to have a spiritual experience. <laughs> you know? Again, the dumbest smart guy in the room. I used to sit in the bar at happy hour and run the Jeopardy board. And everybody would go, wow, you're really smart. You should teach college. And the next day I'd be sitting on the bar stool playing Jeopardy. Because in order to teach college, you actually have to go to college. <laughs> Get a degree that requires work and action. I was too busy sitting on the bar stool. You know? One of the gifts in my life is I got sober and then I did that stuff. Um... Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to practice his principles in all our affairs and carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Now, carrying the message to the alcoholic who still suffers, that means every alcoholic. Because here's a newsflash, if you haven't already figured it out. When we get here, we're suffering, but it's very primitive suffering. When I got here, my suffering was, I need a doctor, a cup of coffee, and a place to live. That's primitive, basic, survival kind of suffering. I have to tell you, many years later, my problem is, how do I figure out how to live like a sane and sober, responsible citizen in this world with these people? Now, that's a form of suffering. It's just a little more complicated than the first kind. But there isn't an alcoholic in this room who isn't suffering in some way, shape, or form. So you can help anyone. It doesn't have to be the obvious, snotty-nosed, yellow-eyed, stinky newcomer coming through the door. <laughs> Every alcoholic in the room needs help. Everybody. You know? I need it every day, all the time. I tell God all the time, hey, your number one problem child, showing up for duty. Hope you have something special in store for me today, because I need help. You know? So, we're all suffering. So there's no limits to who you can help when you practice your 12th step. And then again, the old curmudgeonly hardcore thing from the guys who got me, helped me stay sober. Practice these principles in all our affairs. It doesn't say some of them every other Tuesday when we're really feeling like we're in fit spiritual and physical condition. It says practice these principles in all our affairs. Now, I'm not claiming perfection, and there's also, just like every alcoholic in this room is still suffering, every alcoholic in this room is imperfect. So it isn't about perfection, but it's about striving for perfection. You, know, you will make progress. The old the cliche about progress, not perfection. The only guaranteed way I've found to make progress is to strive for perfection. And then you make progress. So strive for perfection. Strive to apply these principles in all your affairs. <laughs> and it can happen. But you will have an amazing journey trying to do that. The progress will be amazing. You know, I, I used to, here's a typical day for Larry 25 years ago. A typical day for Larry was I would wake up, come to around noon, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and next to my bed was a bottle of wild turkey and a mirror of another substance. And I would grab those just to be able to sit up. Then I would go and take a shower and order some food, have it delivered, because the sun was still up. As a vampire, I could not walk outside, so we would have to have food delivered. And then I would eat something, and then I'd go back to bed for another three or four hours. Now it would be getting dark, and I could oil up my wings, my bat wings, because it was coming up to the time of night where I could emerge from my crypt. 
and engage in all the various activities that I used to do to do the things I do and get the things I did and have all that wonderful fun I was having. And along the way, I would visit policemen. You know, that I lived in the 112th precinct in New York City. I was convinced those guys had me on their list. Part of their agenda every week was to hassle Larry Fishman. Coincidentally, I got sober and those guys got well. They have not broken out with an urge to arrest me since I stopped drinking. <laughs> they got better. I stopped drinking, they got better. Go figure that out. That, but that was my typical day. Awake at noon, alcohol and other substances, stagger through the day, wait for it to get dark, and then go out and take advantage of normal, sane citizens like a wolf preying on sheep. That was my day. That was my life. Day in, day out for a really long time. It was awful. At the end, the thing, the thing that got to me at the end, by the way, was not any moral dilemmas about what I was doing because I was morally bankrupt. So there was no moral dilemma. You know, and there was nobody left in my life trying to help me. So it wasn't like there was any concern from my loved ones or anything like that. The thing that got to me at the end, the most painful part was for the last two years, even in a crowded room, I was always alone. It was the loneliness. It was such a painful and lonely existence. It was horrible. If I had the courage, I would have killed myself. You know, I picked up the gun a couple of times, and I just couldn't, couldn't bring it up to the side of my head. I understand now that was God looking out for me then, too. Now, I get up in the morning early. I get up, I kiss my wife. Holy cow, there's a woman in my life. Are you kidding me? The last two years of my life, even the wrong kind of woman wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> so I get up, I kiss my wife, I say, thank you, Lord. I take the dogs out as I described to you. We stop on the, on the stairs. Oh, by the way, the stairs of the house I live in, which I own, holy God. The only thing I owned when I got here was a pair of dock siders with holes in them and a pair of ratty torn jeans. And I had literally 10 cents in my pocket and I had two nickels. That's what I had when I got here. Those were my earthly possessions. After I get done with the dogs and praying and meditating, I get dressed, I go to work, I show up early and alert and suited up and ready to go. I didn't have any sense of responsibility when I was drinking. You know, that's God working in my life. You know, and then I try to do the best I can every day without being selfish 99.999% of the time. It's down to about 99.9. The 99999 part has faded a little over all these years. You know, so practice the principles in all our affairs. We won't make it, but we do the best we can. Um, and then the real, and then the, the majesty of putting it all together. When you have ten, eleven, and twelve all working in your life, and you have a conscious contact with a higher power, you know, and you're taking time out of your day to pray and meditate, and you're trying to carry this message, and you're helping other alcoholics. Now I have to tell you. For me, what that has what that has done is not anything measurable. What it's done is it's given me back my dignity and my self-respect. When I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror, I actually like the guy I see. You know, I despise my despise is nowhere near an adequate word. There isn't a word in the English language with enough emotional power to describe how I used to feel about myself. Self-loathing will have to do because you can draw out the loathing and give everybody an idea. But even that doesn't really do it justice to the self-hatred that I had, you know, because of all the guilt and shame of how I was living, which I didn't know I had because I was too numb to have feelings. So I didn't even know I hated myself because I was full of guilt and shame. Um... So I have my dignity and my self-respect back. And what that's led to is viewing the world a lot differently. I used to view the world as a horrible place to be in. And I couldn't wait to get out of it. I found out us alcoholics do not do not have a dying problem. Sometimes we try to counsel alcoholics, especially alcoholics that get hurt and wind up in the hospital when we go and try to help them. And you know, we say things like, how could you be here? That wrong approach. Alcoholics do not have a dying problem. We're not afraid of that. You know, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to die. Eh, wrong approach. We alcoholics do not have a dying problem. That's a relief for most of us. Oh, good, I'm going to die. Yay. What we have is not a dying problem. We have a living problem. 
So when you go to that kind of sick bed in the hospital, you got to carry a message about how about finding a way to live in the in this world without hating yourself. You know? And that ties back to that pride and self respect, that dignity and self respect part that comes back when you try doing some esteemable acts and you build some self esteem and you're okay with yourself on a daily basis. When I got here, I promise you, if there was a pill that we could take where no matter who you were, it didn't matter who you were, no matter who you were, we could switch places, you'd become me and I'd become you, I would have taken that pill with any one of you on the spot. Now, today, you can't pry me out of these shoes. You know, I like the guy I am today. And my father died long before I got sober. And I, I pray all the time that he has some idea that I've become at least half the man that he always wished I would become. You know, and that's a gift. That's the gift of the steps at work in your life. Thanks a lot for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.